that you could join us today um, as we celebrate National Wetlands Month here um, nationally. So super fun. Um, my colleagues and I are excited to talk about the wetland ecosystems and share a bit about how our work helps protect these wonderful landscapes. Um, you'll also learn about ways to get involved with our mission through our volunteer program today. Um, I do want to share a very special thank you to our Legacy Club and Warren Knoll Society members in attendance today. These special groups of members support important chapter priorities both now and into the future, and we are so grateful to be on this conservation path with you. Um, if you are interested in learning about, you know, how to become one of these special memberships, um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Um, I'd love to talk with you more about that, or if we are in your plans, I'd also love to welcome you to our Legacy Club. Um, my contact information will be in the follow-up information um, for this event um, in the email we send later on. So look forward to hearing from you. So we'd love to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, I am coming to you from the beautiful Baraboo Hills, which are the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk, the Miami, the Menominee, the Sauk, and the Mahuaki nations. The Nature Conservancy respectfully acknowledges the earlier inhabitants of, the Wisconsin, of Wisconsin as previous and current custodians of these lands and waters, and we pay our respects to the elders of these peoples past, present, and future. We acknowledge the continued cultural, social, and spiritual connections of the indigenous peoples who have and continue to live and work here. We recognize and value the essential and continuing contributions of indigenous peoples to the region, as well as the need to continue building meaningful relationships and partnerships that will help restore and protect the lands and waters upon which all life depends. And we encourage everyone to spend time learning about the histories, the culture, and knowledge of Wisconsin's First, Na First Nations. So thank you. And so before we get started, um, I'd love to share a few items to help you participate in today's event. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so during this webinar, you will not have camera or audio privileges. Um, so if you have any comments or technical questions, please direct them to the chat box at the bottom center of your screen. Our moderators are working behind the scenes and they're ready to help answer any questions that you have. Next to the chat icon is the question bubble. During the Q&A session or during our speaker's remarks, please type any questions you have for our speakers in that box. We'll try to get to every question, um, so don't hold back if you're curious. And we are recording this event and we'll share the recording in our follow-up email um, for you to view at any time. All right, so let's get started. And so just so you know where we're going, if we go to the next slide, um, our presentation at a glance, We'll have two of our conservation colleagues that will share about their work with wetlands and how our work helps protect endangered species. Um, and then we'll learn all about how to get involved through volunteering. And then we'll finish the event with an interactive question and answer session with all of our panelists today. Okay, so here to teach us about the different types of wetlands in Wisconsin is our Director of Water Conservation, Sarah Gatsky. Sarah, we are so excited to have you with us today. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah, and as Elizabeth said, I'm the Director of Water Conservation for the Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin. And I'm really excited that you've all joined us today to talk a little bit more about Wisconsin's wetlands. Um, wetlands are this sort of in-between ecosystem where land meets water. And because of that diversity in the habitat, life flourishes there. Wetlands help support 40% um, of the world's species, and they're really important for people as well. So globally, our wetlands cover about 4% of the Earth's surface, but here in Wisconsin, they cover 15% of the state. And before we um, drained many of them for agricultural and other building purposes um, in the late 19th century, they actually covered 30% of Wisconsin. So wetlands are really an important part of Wisconsin's landscape. Today I'm going to tell you a bit about the different types of wetlands that we have in Wisconsin and talk about why they're important for nature and for people and tell you how the Nature Conservancy and our partners are working to protect them, specifically how we're using some science tools that we've developed to, to do that work. Okay, so um, 
due to the diversity of the geography, geology, and climate we have in Wisconsin, there's a wide variety of wetland habitats represented here. So wetlands are ecosystems where the, the water table is either at or really very close to the ground surface for most of the growing season during most years. And because of that, there's little oxygen in the soil and the dominant plants are those that can exist in wet conditions. The source of the water in wetlands is from either pre precipitation, surface flow or groundwater flow or some combination of those three sources. The primary factors that influence a wetlands type is the hydrology, so the timing, frequency, and amount of water found on the site, then the soil type, and finally the plant life that um, the site supports. So in this image that we're looking at, um, we're seeing a, a range of wetlands that we would classify based on the hydrology of the site. So on one extreme, we've got marshes where the water is deep and more consistently present. And then as um, the water on site gets shallower and more variable throughout the year, we move into something that we will class classify more as a swamp or in this diagram, we're calling it a shrub and forested wetland. So people have a variety of different classification systems um, for grouping and naming different types of wetlands. And I just want to recognize that I might say something different than you've seen in the past. Um, and that's just sort of the nature of wetlands. They're quite complex um, and the naming and classifying um, can be complex as well. So in that last, um, in the last slide, I talk to you about the different types of wetlands based on hydrology and left out of that was some important Wisconsin wetlands um, that we um, we have here and they are our peatlands. Peatlands are wetlands with a thick waterlogged soil layer that are made up of dead and decaying plant material. And so two types of peatlands that we find in Wisconsin are bogs and fens. Um, the water in a bog comes from precipitation as, and is as acidic, whereas in fens, mostly the water is from um, groundwater flowing or upwelling at that site, and then it is often alkaline and has high mineral content. And so because of that, um, those sources of water and the water chemistry and soil condition, bogs and fens are home to some really rare and specialized species. In fact, our next speaker is going to tell us more about the endangered Heinz and emerald dragonfly who calls fens homes. Okay, so now I thought we would take a look at some um, photos of wetlands from Wisconsin so that we can kind of put a picture to those different uh, classifications we just talked about. So I'm going to give you some examples from both our Maguanago River watershed and Door County where the Nature Conservancy is really, um, you know, involved in conserving the landscape there. So here's an example of a marsh in, in the Strawberry Creek wetlands of Door County. During parts of the year, marshes have standing water that's at least six inches deep, and the source of that water can either be from surface or groundwater flow or both. Um, Next to it, we see an example of a sedge meadow in our Lulu Lake Preserve um, with um, the Crooked Creek flowing through the center of it. These wetlands are dominated by grass-like plants called sedges, and they are wettest in the spring with little or no standing water by the end of the growing season in summer. These wetlands um, were once really common in Wisconsin, but have um, often been drained for agricultural use. Okay, next up we've got um, some wetlands from Sturgeon Bay area of Door County. This is a forested wetland on the left here with um, balsam poplar and blue joint grass and sedges. Um, and it experiences variable flooding with some years um, the soil is, is saturated and other years it isn't. And then next to it, we've got a shrub thicket of alder and willow and um, has wet soil more often than the, the forested wetland example that we just talked about. And it's more likely to have wet soil in the spring and then become increasingly dry over the summer into the fall. And finally, we'll take a oh, go back. Oh, no. Sorry, excuse me while I get back. Previous, that's what we want. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, 
So then finally, we've got um, pictures of some peatlands from our Maguanago River watershed preserves. Uh, first of all, we'll look at the one on the left, the bog. It receives its most of its water from precipitation. Again, it has that acid um, acidic water chemistry and low nutrients in the soil. Bogs um, have a continuous mat of moss that, that often floats on water. And so you might know that you're out on a bog if you give a little jump and it sort of bounces like a really gentle trampoline. Um, then the next, uh, the next picture is the fen, and it occurs in places, again, um, where springs or seeps are bringing that alkaline and sometimes calcium-rich groundwater to the surface. Fens are usually part of a, a larger wetland complex, and fens themselves are actually on the small side, covering a few acres at most. So um, fens can sometimes form a mound, or a, they can, like the bog, have sort of a floating mat that you might be able to find some mineral deposits from that calcium-rich groundwater um, in. OK, so why are wetlands so important? Uh, well, only a small percentage of the land's surface is wetland. Um, they really punch above their weight class. And what I mean by that is they provide a lot of ecosystem services for people. They improve water quality and um, protect water supply. They protect our shorelines from erosion. They help abate flooding. They can sequester carbon, depending on the type. Um, they provide habitat, including for, like we said, rare and endangered species, um, and they're a they're great for recreating and they're also very, very beautiful places. So popping up on the screen here are some recent research findings on the value of wetlands. Research is showing that wetlands are incredibly important for our com economy. They can provide up to 10 times the value of many other land types. So just to highlight a few of these findings, um, we're seeing that restored wetlands can reduce the costs associated with flooding by 92%. Um, and another study found that uh, the in total, restoring a wetland increases its value um, over for the area's ecosystem services by $600 per acre. What's also interesting is that research shows not all wetlands provide the same services and to the same extent. It really depends. So, um, since some wetlands play a more important role for people in nature at the Nature Conservancy and across the conservation community, we want to make sure that, you know, when we're working, we're prioritizing um, protection and restoration of wetlands that best protect nature while also benefiting people. So to do that, we at the Nature Conservancy use science to help us characterize wetlands and understand their connections to the rest of the landscape. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the first two science tools listed, wetlands by design and the Maguanago groundwater tool. And then coming up next, um, Mike is going to mention uh, the third science tool in his talk. But first, let's talk about once we've identified those wetlands, how the Nature Conservancy and partners can protect a wetland um, once we know that the opportunity is there. In the case that there's a willing landowner and, and we have the resources needed, uh, one uh, way we can protect them is to, to purchase the land or purchase an easement uh, with the owner that protects, protects the wetland. Um, if we ourselves already own it or we find a partner who's, who's willing to work with us, we can take steps to help better manage that wetland um, to maintain the ecosystem services, or we can even work to restore a degraded wetland to improve um, those ecosystem services. Uh, another thing that we can do is work on policy that helps us limit the loss of wetlands or provide incentives to restore wetlands. So those are just, you know, some of the tools and individually each of those strategies um, has its place, but it's not uh, by itself going to help us protect the remaining wetlands in Wisconsin or restore the wetlands that we've lost. So we have to work with partners to use a combination of all those tools in order to protect our wetlands. And we've got to keep scaling up that work um, in order to, to really make the, the change that we need. So now let's take a closer look at those science tools I was mentioning that help us target our wetland protection work. Okay, so first up, I'm going to talk about a tool called Wetlands by Design. We collaborated with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources to develop a tool that helps guide watershed and wetland conservation actions that maximize outcomes for both people and nature. 
Like we've talked about, wet, wetlands cover a small fraction of our landscape, but they really play this big role um, in protecting our freshwater systems. So they're key to reducing nutrient loads, maintaining base flow in our streams and mitigating floods. Science can tell us the role that wetlands can play in conserving our natural systems, but um, as practitioners, we didn't have an easy way for, um, for conservationists to, to understand you know, where we work to make sure that our actions um, are maximizing the benefit of the investment that, that we um, have made in, in the wetland restoration. So in order to help us do that targeting, we um, created this tool, Wetlands by Design, and I'm going to quickly give you a schematic example of how it works. So not all wetlands provide the ser same services, um, so it depends on where they're located in the watershed. So in this schematic, the surrounding land use um, is that we've got um, uh, we've got some steep slopes, so we're going to consider how that might play out um, when we're thinking about flood abatement for this wetland. Um, let's see here, click again. So we see that we've got uh, a, you know this steep slopes, and it's surrounded by impervious surfaces. Um, that's these little houses, and so we know that we have water that could be running off and running off of that impervious surface and downhill very quickly. So next we consider um, what the internal effectiveness of the wetland might be to slow floods. So in this example, we see that we've got this wetland occurring in a depression, so it can temporarily hold waters and it also has dense vegetation. And that's really impor important. It provides something called surface roughness, which is really effective at slowing flood waters. So then finally, we, we're thinking about things like the um, social significance and economical significance. This wetland is situated um, in a place that it, it could help reduce damage of, from flooding to downstream areas. So it has good, good social and, and economic significance. So we would say that, you know, based on our little schematic analysis here, that this wetland is ideal for abating floods. Um, Again, this is just a really simple example of how the tool works for considering um, just that one aspect of flood abatement. However, in the tool, we combined flood abatement information with other factors of interest, like impact on water quality, shoreline erosion, and carbon storage to give us an overall rank of the potential benefits conservation actions could have um, on any given wetland throughout the state. So, we did this analysis, made it the information that we generated from it freely available in an online application that allows users, um, including folks like the, the staff at Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, other environmental consultants, and other conservation organizations. Um, it's freely um, available to them, and, um, and they can use it to uh, to explore the potential benefits of wetland conservation in areas that they're working in and interested in. So we're going to go next and look at a screenshot of the tool itself. And um, we're viewing a portion of the McGuanago River watershed in southeastern Wisconsin. You can see that the current wetlands are in green and the red is where we've lost wetlands that could potentially be restored. The intensity of either the green or the red shade indicates how many services a wetland is or could be providing. So depending on what you're interested in, we might want to look for a wetland to restore that could provide us the greatest number of services, or perhaps we're really interested in something like flood abatement and we would target based on that one service. Um, we are seeing this tool being applied across the state with um, many different partners using it, and they're using it to decide where to restore wetlands um, to reduce flooding. In particular, they're doing that in Dane County, and then um, other land trusts are using it to implementing planning exercises to think about how they might address climate change in the future, so they're really interested in that carbon storage service. Okay, so then the next tool, oh, sorry got ahead of myself again. Um, the next tool we're going to talk about is, um, is the McGuanago groundwater tool. And uh, it was created, uh, as the name implies, to, um, to help some do some decision support work in the McGuanago River Basin. 
Much like wetlands by design, this tool is based on science, takes that scientific analysis and serves it up in a way that decision makers and non-scientists can easily Im interpret and then put um, into action. So um, in the Maguanago River watershed, we have one of the most small or intact small river systems in southern Wisconsin. It's got notable aquatic species biodiversity and habitat that is, and some of that is supported by groundwater. And we call that those groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, those ecosystems can include lakes, streams, and wetlands. So this watershed um, is also experiencing some pressure from population growth and the source of drinking water is the shallow aquifer. And so as more people come in and uh, more industry comes in, there's more pressure on that aquifer. So you can see in this conceptual diagram that if we were to um, put a uh, high capacity well in the shallow aquifer, it would be taking some of the groundwater that would flow to support those ecosystems, those uh, rivers, wetlands, and lakes, and we would be capturing that water for human use, which could could negatively impact that those groundwater dependent ecosystems. So we worked with groundwater hydrologists from partner organizations to create a, a model and then this decision support tool to help us understand um, when and where those, those wells, those high capacity wells might be capturing enough groundwater that would have a negative impact on the ecosystems. So the tool can be used sort of as a first line of um, screening to think about where putting wells may or may not impact nature. And this information can help us help decision makers cite wells um, to reduce impact on sensitive ecosystems. So now we'll go to the screenshot of the tool. And um, so what we're seeing in this image is um, areas around the Lulu Lake Fen, which is in the watershed, that are sensitive to groundwater pumping. So the model is showing us that a high capacity well pumping in these red areas um, would lower levels in the Lulu Lake Fen enough that the impact could be significant to the health of the wetland. So knowing this helps us avoid impacts um, to those really sensitive areas. All right. So um, I love science and I am so glad that you all joined us to hear a little bit about these tools today, but I don't wanna end on a screenshot of an of a online tool. Um, computer models and science is great and wetlands help us in so many ways and you know, science can tell us and, and quantify a lot of those, but it's not great at putting a value on the beauty of wetlands. So I just wanted to make sure that we wrap up by taking a few minutes um, to have uh, a reminder of, of how beautiful wetlands can be. Um, so this is a photo of a, a wetlands surrounding the Northern portion of Lulu Lake in our Maguanago River Preserve. Um, and then let's move over to a view of the southern portion of the lake and the wetland complex there and a beautiful fall day. Um, and so the foreground is that wetland complex that's providing clean, clear, beautiful water for Lulu Lake. And then finally, we'll take a look at our crooked, um, at our at Crooked Creek flowing through a sedge meadow that's again also feeding Lulu Lake. So if you want to get a view, view of many different types of wetlands, come on out to the Lulu Lake Preserve in Moguanago. Um, it serves up some incredible views. Thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Oh my gosh, it is so wonderful um, to have you with us today and to share about your knowledge and expertise with these wetlands um, and also to share how beautiful they are because that is such an added benefit. Um, and I love learning about the science-based tools and that we can share these with partners across the state to help protect these important ecosystems. So thank you. Um, everyone, please remember to add your questions for Sarah in the Q&A box below. Um, she'll be joining us for our Q&A session at the end of the event and would love to answer them. So just a reminder to drop those in there. All right, everyone, um, now it's time for some fun. We are going to test your wetland knowledge. Um, we have a couple wetland quiz questions for you. Um, I will read the question and then they'll pop up on your screen in a poll. Um, you can select which answer, answer you think is right. Um, and then we'll see how much you know about the wonders of wetlands. Um, so if we can get to the next slide, please. Okay, this is our first question. 
At the end of the 19th century, about what percent of Wisconsin's landmass was covered in wetlands? Let me just launch the poll here and you'll all get a chance to answer. We'll give you about 20 seconds um, to kind of see what, what y'all think. Oh, oh we're getting, getting some answers in here. All right, just a couple more answers and we can wrap it up. Okay, all right, last chance. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll and then I'm gonna share the results out. And if we can go to the next slide, you'll see that so many of you are correct. We must have some wetland wizards in here. It is 30%. So thank you all. Um, let's go to our next question here. Um, what wetland creature am I? So this wonderful little picture here, is it A, a leopard frog, B, a spring peeper, C, a tree frog, or D, an American bullfrog? What do you think? All right, we're getting some answers in. All right, doesn't look like anyone's thinking it's an American bullfrog. <laughs> All right, last chances. Let's see what you got. Any guesses out there? All right, oh, well, there's some more coming in. Don't be Googling it right now. All right, All right. I'm gonna end the poll. And if we can go to the next slide, it is a spring peeper. Um, that was kind of a tricky one, um, but they're the ones that you hear right away in the spring that are calling right around dusk. Um, I always, it makes me think of spring when I hear them and I know that, you know, the warmer weather is coming. So they're, they're great little friends. All right, so thank you everyone for, doing those quiz questions. We'll have another chance to test your knowledge on wetlands coming up. Um, but for our next presenter here, um, I would love to introduce Mike Grimm, our conservation ecologist, who will take us up to the Door Peninsula and teach us about the special creature that you all help us protect there. Mike, when you're ready, uh, let it fly. Okay, thanks Elizabeth. Um, thanks Sarah and uh, everyone else for joining us today. So uh, as Elizabeth said, my name is Mike Grimm and I'm a conservation ecologist uh, with the Conservancy and I work out of our Northeast Wisconsin project office up here in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, I was born and raised in Green Bay and I've been with the Conservancy for about 30 years. So let's see, grab the... So, um, and by the way, I was pulling for the bullfrog, but you know, I guess that didn't work out so well. Um, so my talk today is going to be a uh, it's kind of a short story on how the conservancy uses um, natural history knowledge, uh, science, and um, information that we gather from around the world, actually, uh, to do conservation uh, where we work. And in this case, uh, this is a story about an insect, the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, uh, Iran, which I'll explain in the, in the talk here, and how we used the combination of both of those kinds of uh, concepts to really bring some conservation impact to our work uh, here in Door County. And so that's, uh, that was just a shot of the Door Peninsula on the previous slide. So the insect, of course, is the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. And here's a photo of one in flight. And then one uh, that, uh, that, we, that we're holding here. It's, a, it's an insect. It's uh, very rare globally, but locally abundant in Door County in certain areas. Uh, it's federally endangered and it was, uh, 
put on the list, the federally endangered list in the US in 1995. And in fact, it's the only dragonfly that's on that list. Um, the name Heinz uh, comes from James Hine, who discovered the species in Ohio back in uh, 1929. And he was a curator at the uh, Natural History Museum at uh, Ohio State University. Today, the species is known from Missouri, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and one site up in Ontario, Canada. And uh, most of the, well, the most productive sites where the population uh, is highest and we have the highest density of larvae in the breeding sites is really here in Door County. So we have uh, multiple sites in Door County and the populations are generally uh, large. It's uh, actually a common dragonfly in certain spots if you're out in the summer up here in Door County. And uh, these are just some physical characters of the, or attributes or uh, distinctive features of the dragonfly. Uh, if you happen to see it, if, you, if it's flying around, it just looks like a, about a two and a half inch shining black dragonfly cruising about four to 10 feet off the ground. Um, the adults are out in late June and early August. Uh, they're breeding, uh, laying eggs, uh, which will hatch the following spring. Um, if you have a close look at one, uh, you can see that it has kind of an arcing abdomen, which is pretty distinctive. It's got emerald green eyes, it has diagonal thorax bars, which are kind of yellowish, yellow green. And the males uh, of the dragonfly have a very distinctive set of claspers uh, on the uh, end of its abdomen. You can actually see, it, see that in flight if you're close enough. And in the little inset photo, you can really see those uh, claspers. That's what it uses to clasp onto the female uh, when they're breeding. So the habitat for this animal is, um, is a fen. And as Sarah mentioned, fens are uh, systems, wetland systems that are groundwater fed. And most fens have a high alkaline uh, content, hard water, calcium rich. Uh, and that's true here in Door County. Uh, the map on the right, I mean, I'm sorry, on the left is a map of the upper part of Door County. Uh, the green areas are wetlands. Uh, the red stars are known breeding sites uh, for the Heinz Emerald. There's one up at the Mink, uh, there's a few sites up at the Mink River, uh, somewhere on North Bay, and then uh, coming down through the Mud Lake area, uh, down by Bailey's Harbor and Toff Point. And the uh, sites that it breeds in is, uh, groundwater discharge sites. So it's not at the springs themselves, but uh, discharge water moving through these um, slow, shallow uh, systems, uh, often uh, dominated by uh, sedges, uh, in some cases cattail if they're a little more open. Uh, there's a variable degree of woody vegetation uh, in these sites. The site that's pictured here has a lot of alder, uh, some small cedar and, and tamarack mixed in. Uh, the site actually photo photograph here is of uh, one of the main research sites uh, for the dragonfly in Door County. So you can see that uh, the sites are, are not open water. I mean, you can barely see the water here. Uh, there's little rivulets of water flowing through the sedge mat here, uh, maybe two to three inches deep. Uh, and that is the water in which uh, the females will be laying their eggs. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's not what you might consider a typical uh, dragonfly wetland. Um, it's a variable uh, through the season. This actually may go dry uh, later in the year. And uh, yet the dragonfly persists here because it goes down in the crayfish burrows. So that's a, another uh, main feature of these uh, breeding sites is that uh, we have these burrowing crayfish uh, that provide some uh, refugia for the dragonfly when dragonfly larva when the water uh, decreases later in the summer. So how does this dragonfly, this rare um, federally endangered dragonfly get wrapped into a story about Iran? Well, uh, it goes back to 1971, about uh, 51, well, 51 years ago in Iran, in the city of Ramzar, which is a 
kind of a resort city on the Caspian Sea, in the north uh, part of uh, Iran. There was a conference, of, uh, an international conference of wetland scientists and conservationists. And during this conference, the attendees uh, developed and adopted something called the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance. And it was signed on February 2nd, uh, 1971 which coincidentally, or well, not coincidentally, it's on purpose, that is uh, World Wetlands Day. Uh, February 2nd is always celebrated as World Wetlands Day in honor of this uh, agreement that was signed. And the agreement lays out criteria and a process by which wetlands anywhere in the world could be uh, designated as wetlands of international significance. And Countries sign on to this agreement. The US signed on to the agreement in 1986, and there are now 160 uh, countries that are part of this agreement. And the program is administered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service here in the United States. And there are currently 41 uh, Ramsar sites in the US. Uh, countries with the most Ramsar sites, just you know, as an interesting note, uh, United Kingdom has 175 uh, designated sites, uh, Mexico is 142. Uh, and again, we have 41 sites in the US. So as I suspect you are um, figuring out, um, the Nature Conservancy in Door County uh, back in 2011 had the idea of trying to designate these wetlands uh, in the northern part of Door County as a Ramsar wetland. And as you can imagine, when a bunch of conservationists and international agreements get together, things get a little uh, messy. So uh, the picture on the right, um, the map on the right, I'll explain. But um, this was an effort that a number of groups uh, engaged in. It was, it was led by the Conservancy here, but um, Fish and Wildlife Service, DNR, uh, Town of Liberty Grove, private landowners, the Door County Land Trust, the Bridges Sanctuary, uh, all participated in, in the process of, of um, the nomination of this area as a Ramsar wetland. Uh, there are nine criteria that we had to address um, in the nomination process. And although you don't need to meet all nine criteria, uh, we did uh, meet all nine criteria set out by the Ramsar Agreement. And the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly played a large part in that because it is a federally endangered animal um, and a significant portion of its population resides uh, in this wetland area, so globally. So the map on the right uh, sort of indicates uh, some aspects of this designation. So the red line, uh, the red boundary line that you see uh, is an outline of an area that uh, is eligible for new lands to be designated as part of the Ramsar site. The actual Ramsar site is shown in green. Uh, those are the wetlands that have already been designated uh, and they include lands by the Conservancy, the um, all the partners who I just mentioned, the DNR, the Town of Liberty Grove, some private landowners, uh, the Land Trust, and the uh, Ridges Sanctuary. Again, the red stars are where the Heinz Emerald has its breeding sites. Uh, the black uh, ovals are general locations of two TNC preserves here, the Mink River Preserve up in the north, and the Mud, uh, North Bay Mud Lake uh, Preserve in the uh, sort of south, southern part of the Ramsar site. Um, let me go on here. So this site uh, was designated in October 6, 2014. Uh, it encompasses about 11,400 acres. Uh, there are nine state natural areas in this Ramsar wetland, uh, one state park, which is Newport State Park, and one state wildlife area, which is the Mud Lake Wildlife Area. And it's estimated to hold about 30 to 40% of the population of Heinz Emerald Dragonflies in the world. Um, Sarah mentioned a tool uh, that we, we used here in Door County in our help with, uh, to help with the conservation of the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. And that was a groundwater uh, recharge delineation um, 
tool that we worked with uh, with the Wisconsin Geologic and Natural History Survey, where they looked at the, air, the area of land that contributes water to the breeding sites of the Heinz Emerald. And because it's a groundwater fed uh, or groundwater dependent wetland uh, that the Heinz breeds in, uh, we wanted to know where that water is coming from. So they mapped out the recharge areas for these wetlands and that mapping of the recharge areas played a lot of, of uh, played a large role in determining the boundaries of this Ramsar site. So uh, the tool also helps us in terms of uh, talking to the local zoning administrator uh, about different uh, possibilities for um, zoning designations in these recharge areas. And it helps uh, determine uh, for, for ourselves and for the land trusts and the ridges uh, protection opportunities. So I will stop here and give up my control. Well, thanks so much, Mike. It was so fun to learn about the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly and the incredible wetlands up in Door County. Um, that whole peninsula is just an important ecosystem and highlighting, um, you know, highlighting why is so important. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing that knowledge. Um, also, just a little reminder to put your questions for Mike in the, in the Q&A box. He will be joining us as well for the Q&A session. But now it is time to test some more knowledge about your wetlands. So our question here is there are 41 designated Ramsar wetlands in, in the United States. Of those, how many have been designated in Wisconsin? I'm going to launch, is it A2, B3, C6, or D9? So curious what y'all think. We got some good answers coming in. Ooh, all around the board. I feel like we need to have some fun music right now. Maybe next one we'll get some going. All right. Leave it open for a few more seconds. We still got answers coming in. Okay, all right, last chance. Okay, um, next slide, please. The answer is six. We have six Ramsar wetlands in Wisconsin, which is pretty incredible. Um, and you can see from this map where they all are kind of scattered around. Um, so really an important part of our state. Um, so good job, everyone. Okay, and then we have one more question, our last question today. Um, how long does it take for a Heinz Emerald Dragonfly to grow from an egg into an adult in Door County? Is it A, four months, B, one to two years, C, four to five years, or D, nobody really knows? What do you think? All right, we're getting some, some answers coming in. Yeah, it would be tough to figure that one out. So I wonder. All right, thanks everybody. Okay, last chance, last call. Get your answers in. All right, next slide. It is four to five years, which is so crazy to me. Um, but also why these wetlands are so important. So thanks everyone for testing your knowledge with us. Um, last but not least for our presentation today, um, I would love to invite Katie Embley, our volunteer engagement fellow, um, up onto the screen here. Um, so Katie, thanks so much for being here today. Um, once we get up here, we'll let you take her away and talk all about our, our volunteer program here. Sounds good, thank you. Hi everyone, I am Katie, so I'm the Volunteer Engagement Fellow. I'm based here in Madison, Wisconsin, but I work all around the state helping to connect people who are passionate about nature with the work that is getting done on the ground. 
I hope that like me, you all are feeling really inspired by the great work we've learned about today. So I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you just a little bit about some of the ways that you can connect with us. Next slide, please. Fortunately, there are many different ways that you can get involved. Our staff really do rely on volunteers to help protect nature and to get our work done. So volunteering is a great way to contribute to the Nature Conservancy's mission. Last year alone, we had over 80 volunteers involved with our projects. And keep in mind with those numbers that volunteer opportunities have been really limited by the pandemic. So this turnout was really incredible. And I think it just shows how important volunteer work is to conservation and again, to helping our staff um, accomplish this great work. And fortunately, there's gonna be even more ways to get involved this year. This year. With, in fact, the past couple of months alone, we're already seeing, you know, a huge jump in the number of volunteer opportunities that we have. In April, we had a big tree planting project in the Barrago Hills and volunteers like yourselves um, helped us get over 1,000 trees planted. You can kind of see that pictured on one of our slides right here. In addition, last month, we did some citizen science where we participated in the City Nature Challenge. Now, if you're unfamiliar with City Nature Challenge, it's a big citizen science competition where cities all over the world encourage people to make biodiversity observations using the iNaturalist app. Both the Madison and Milwaukee areas got involved for the first time ever, um, just showing you know, the great diversity of plants and animals that Wisconsin has even in our urban areas. Beyond these events, there have been other opportunities as well that happen you know, pretty much every week. Volunteers have participated in everything from leading nature hikes in Madison and Milwaukee to cleaning up trash at our Chewaukee prairies. And there's still so much more for us to do, including this summer, and there are a variety of ways that you guys can get involved beyond what I've already shared. One of the main avenues I would say for involvement would be in our stewardship work days. So TNC has preserves all around the state, and we really do rely on volunteers to help keep them in great shape. Some of the things you might expect to do at one of these work days would be to, by helping to remove garlic mustard or helping to burn bush piles, among you know, just a variety of other things that come up. There is no experience required to participate in one of these. Um, so as long as you're willing to show up and learn, our staff and other volunteers can help show you what needs to be done. Again, these work days are a huge help um, and it can be a really great way to learn more about conservation work or to pick up a new skill like plant ID. And I think, you know, we can talk about these work days, but I think some of the experiences of uh, other volunteers kind of speak to just how fun and great of an opportunity they can be. We've had volunteers at some of our sites who have been working with us weekly for up to, you know, 30 years. I think that's just a great testament, again, to both how meaningful this work is and just how enjoyable it can be. Um, in fact, one of the ways that we use volunteers that is very popular for those who do it is with our controlled burn program. Um, one of the pictures on the slide is one of our volunteers at a burn actually. Um, prescribed burns are a really important part of our work and we really do need more hands involved um, for a successful burn season. One limitation for these um, volunteer programs is that you do need to be trained for the burns, but never fear if you reach out to us and let us know you're interested, we're more than happy to help you get trained and fully certified. The spring season for burning is over, but there might be more opportunities in the fall and we could certainly use help again next spring. Um, it, training will take a little bit of your time. So again, if you're interested and you think that might be something you wanna do, um, please reach out. I'm more than happy to share how we can get you certified and um, start that process. So again, um, our volunteer opportunities are not just stewardship. There are many other ways that you can get involved beyond that. One new volunteer program we have is our Photography Corps. So this program is open to experienced amateur or professional photographers. So we do ask that you have a little bit of experience before signing up. But once you're involved, um, all we ask is that participants send us the awesome photos that they take at our preserves and natural areas around the state. These, this opportunity is largely self-guided, so you can contribute as much or as little time as you want. And it's a great chance to see your work in a Nature Conservancy publication. It also helps us to share our mission and just to show people the wonders of the areas that we're protecting. Just as with our stewardship work days, it really does help us accomplish our mission. So again, if stewardship work days are not for you, maybe photography um, or something like that could be a great way for you to get involved. 
Now, there's also a couple of programs that we have coming up more towards the end of the summer. One of them will be a program that we're just going to be getting started, which is our advocacy network of volunteers. Um, in that role, you'd be helping our government relations staff in everything from tabling to writing letters. It's a great opportunity if you're looking for volunteer work to do at home. And again, um, it's something that's going to be starting up more in the fall. So although we don't have too much going on with it currently, I really encourage you to reach out now if you think you'd be interested um, in that. And then I mentioned City Nature Challenge a little bit earlier. Um, we do have other citizen science opportunities that arise, for example, at the end of April, um, where we participated in the City Nature Challenge, which is the big bio blitz, and we plan on participating in that competition again next year. Um, we expect there to be a few more citizen science opportunities coming up um, again this summer and fall. For example, if you've ever heard of Journey North, which is a citizen science opportunity with um, UW, I know they're looking for more volunteers to help um, make observations around the state. They have a lot um, of observations that occur in urban areas, but we're hoping to encourage um, people to get out and partner with them and come to our preserves and make other citizen science observations. Um, so that's one opportunity if citizen science is more of your thing. And again, this is really just a small sample of the work that volunteers help us with. And I think there really is something for everyone. Um, so I hope to see you guys inspired to get involved. And you might be wondering, but how do we, I do that? Um, so next slide, please. The best way to sign up to participate is to fill out our volunteer interest form on our website and to sign up for a volunteer newsletter. Again, same place on our website. I think um, we already put the link in the chat for um, that website um, and it's where you know all of this information lives. Um, just reach out and I'll get back to you soon. If you're really eager to get started and involved, um, just a quick plug, we do have a work day that's happening even this weekend. Again, reach out and I can get you that information pretty soon. Well, thank you. I hope to see you all out in the field. Thank you, Katie. It's the volunteer program has come so far with your help and we're just so grateful to have you um, share it with us today. And we will send the link in the follow up um, email that we have for this event as well. So everyone can reach out, um, but please volunteering is so important. And um, we really are grateful for everyone who, who lends their hands and their other talents with us. Um, okay, everyone. So that was our last presentation um, for today. Um, and so we are gonna move into our question and answer session. Um, so please, any questions that you have for any of our presenters today, please put them in the Q&A box. We would love to answer them um, and just you know understand what you're curious in. If we can go to the next slide, just a little reminder of you know where that box is located on your screen. Um, so yeah, so please feel free to, to reach out. But with that, I think we can stop sharing the slides and we'll just you know have a nice conversation here. <laughs> All right, everyone, great presentations. Are you ready for some questions? <laughs> All right, so um, what are the greatest risks to our wetlands in Wisconsin? Uh, Sarah, Mike? I'd love to let Mike start us off. All right, um, risks, yeah. Well, as Sarah, as you, you mentioned, uh, we've lost um, quite a few of our wetlands uh, in Wisconsin. And <clears throat> given all of the services that they do provide, uh, we really cannot afford to lose any more. I mean, we really need to be um, actually restoring as many wetlands as we can. And that's, that's a very difficult, um, it's a very diff difficult challenge because some of the wetlands have been paved over um, and they are basically <clears throat> not, uh, uh, storable, uh, but some are, and, uh, many of these are up in, uh, up in our agricultural landscapes. And so I guess, uh, I will get to answer your question here <laughs> about what are the greatest threats, but I'm just sort of giving a little preamble. Um, many of the landscapes, many of our opportunities lie in these, um, sort of rural areas, uh, agriculturally uh, used right now. And so uh, the biggest threats 
uh, I guess, two wetlands are um, you know, physical loss through drainage um, for wetland purpose, I mean, for agricultural purposes, or in some cases, uh, developmental purpose, you know, development, uh, filling wetlands. Um, and there's sort of a, um, a process of incrementally losing wetlands. It's rare that an entire wetland will be filled, uh, but uh, there's a creep from these uh, upland areas to sort of build out a little bit, fill a little bit. Uh, and over time, you really lose some of the uh, essential services and functions of these wetlands. So I guess the biggest risks are um, any continued loss <clears throat> of any wetland acreage uh, through agricultural drainage or um, developmental development pressure uh, in our rural landscape. Um, invasive species, certainly big, uh, big issue um, with Phragmites and reed canary grass uh, sort of being on the top of the list uh, for our, at least our emergent wetlands. And um, one thing that um, we are particularly concerned about uh, here in Northeast Wisconsin with wetlands uh, is uh, nutrient enrichment, uh, phosphorus loading from uh, runoff, you know, non-point runoff uh, in uh, undeveloped areas, uh, usually coming from either uh, uh, on, um, well, farm fields or rural residential uh, landscapes uh, or uh, small, sometimes even small unincorporated uh, communities uh, will be uh, a source for some of this uh, phosphorus loading. So it's a multiple, you know, multiple actors here um, that contribute to the uh, enriching our wetlands beyond a sort of uh, uh, natural state uh, is, is really a problem. That's where you get some of these invasives. I mean, they'll really respond to uh, high phosphorus levels like reed canary grass and Phragmites. They just uh, they really take off when you get a lot of these nutrients. So those are, that's my thoughts on uh, the risks or the threats to wellings. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Could you just maybe touch a little bit more on, you know, why invasive species in a wetland setting, you know, isn't isn't what we're aiming for? Um, sure, I'll, I'll say a couple words, and, and Sarah, you can jump in because I know you've got some experience. <clears throat> excuse me, down in the McGuanagall area. Um, so invasive species are called invasive uh, because they really have a uh, competitive advantage uh, against our native uh, vegetation. Uh, they have likely few uh, herbivores that feed on the plants, so they don't really have that kind of uh, pressure uh, that our native plants have. So they reproduce uh, very well. and. Um, so they outcompete our native plants and they really can extirpate some of our uh, native flora uh, in, in certain areas. So uh, yeah, they're, they, they can be a real problem. Uh, if you've ever seen a Great Lakes coastal wetland overrun by Phragmites, uh, you, you know the impact that these plants can have. And the same with reed canary grass in our uh, sort of wet meadow systems in the state. Reed canary grass is a very aggressive, very uh, uh, competitively advantaged uh, species. So yeah, so there can be problems. Well, I think Mike did a great job with the invasive species uh, question. I guess I would just add that some of some invasives are also benefiting from fire suppression. So our landscape is um, dependent on, on having a natural fire regime that we've been suppressing for a very long time. So getting some fire back on the landscape and in these wetlands can be beneficial too for invasives and, and other reasons. Um, yeah. And maybe a few additional threats I might just sort of mention. Um, climate change being, being one large one. Mm -hmm 
these wetlands are occurring in a very specific location because of the hydrology that exists there. So they can't pick them up and move them someplace else if your climate is changing and, and they're not um, adapt to, to that new climate. Um, and then I would also mention uh, another threat to our wetlands is uh, changes in, in policy. There's been some uh, federal changes that have uh, resulted in uh, weaker protections for our wetlands in the state and throughout the nation. And, and I would just add one more thing that is actually something that we both talked about Sarah, which is uh, the recharge area for some of these groundwater dependent wetlands. Um, you know, we found, and I'm sure this is true in many places uh, with groundwater fed wetlands, that land where that water is falling on the land and then flowing um, in these aquifers down gradient to the wetlands, these, these can be miles from where the actual wetland is. And so um, the land use over these recharge areas really can affect uh, the quality of water and the quantity of water and the variability of, of the water uh, reaching the wetlands. So um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's important to think about uh, you know, the land cover, the land use that's occurring in these uh, recharge areas. Right. Well, thank you both. And, you know, just to touch on, you know, how you mentioned climate change, Sarah, um, Cal and Beth are just wondering, you know, how global warming is affecting Wisconsin wetlands. Um, I don't know if you can expand on that a, a little bit more or if you have anything you want to add. Sure. Yeah. Obviously, climate change is affecting um, precipitation patterns. So, um, we were talking about different wetland types and how they're very dependent on those precipitation patterns. So that can have a big impact on them. Um, just changes in, in the growing season and the timing of that hydrology with the growing season, also a big impact. Um, conditions, you know, if they're hotter in the summer, if we're having drier conditions, um, especially for things like our, our peatlands, that can be really impactful. Um, they require having that saturated soil for um, a large portion of the growing season um, to keep that decaying uh, plant matter um, forming these, these peatlands. Um, also, you know, Mike just talked about groundwater and the importance of that in, in many of these places and um, changes in, in climate also impact our, our groundwater system to some degree. Different pressures on the groundwater, if you know we're seeing in agricultural settings that um, there is less reliable uh, precipitation um, or a longer growing season and the need to bring in additional sources of water to, to take advantage of that longer growing season that can put pressure on, um, on on the groundwater by you know having people install more wells in order to to take advantage of that longer growing season so those are just a couple things it's you know very nuanced mm -hmm. some of the ways that climate change is affecting our wetlands and i'm sure mike has some more ideas to share yeah um so up here in door county um we work a lot with uh, the coastlines of lake michigan and green bay and uh, think a lot about conservation Great Lakes system, as well as our terrestrial work here. And climate change, um, in reference to the Great Lakes, and specifically the, the coastal wetlands of the Great Lakes, um, it's a, as, and I, that was a good word you used, Sarah, nuanced uh, story. Um, what we know or what the models are indicating and it seems like actually what is happening is our precipitation, total yearly precipitation seems to be roughly the same, uh, but what's happening is we're getting um, intense storms uh, that deliver a lot of rain and then you'll have periods uh, without rain. And these intense storms uh, in the last few years, um, I mean, there's a trend, there's an obvious trend over the last 10 years here in Northeast Wisconsin, we're getting these heavy uh, spring uh, rainfall events uh, with uh, 100, 500 year uh, rainfalls um, occurring 
you know, much, uh, much sooner than every 500 years. Uh, we're getting them every several years. And when these rains fall in the spring, uh, they're falling on an agricultural landscape. And that is really driving uh, a lot of sediment loss and nutrient loss uh, from the fields um, down the streams and uh, eroding stream banks and really delivering um, these plumes of sediment uh, and nutrients out into Green Bay, Lower Green Bay, where there's a very uh, large wetland complex uh, along the west shore of Green Bay. And this um, sediment plume uh, of uh, nutrients and, and also uh, fine particles, fine uh, clay particles, really uh, impacts these wetlands. Uh, we're getting uh, inundation in areas um, that are driving species changes. Uh, you know, Phragmites uh, is, and I, and I don't want to like put the entire uh, causal factors on this, you know, spring runoff event, but that uh, nutrient load is exacerbating the Phragmites uh, population in the lower bay. So climate change or the precipitation changes that are coming with the changing climate um, are having you know, direct impacts up here uh, already. And so it's, um, you know, it's, not a, it's not a model anymore. I mean, it's reality. So um, that's part of the world that we work in now up here. Yeah, and you know, speaking of our, our work, um, could someone maybe just share how TNC is working with Wisconsin farmers to help protect our wetlands? Um, because you know that spring runoff, you know, sounds like a key contributor, and um, would love to talk about that. Sure. Uh, it's um, it's not an easy challenge. I mean, I have to be straight here. It's not an easy challenge. Uh, these, um, these agricultural lands have been in production for years. There's patterns, um, landowner farmers, the producers have, um, you know, a, uh, a history of working land, a certain acreage uh, to produce certain crops. And so uh, they depend upon, you know, the crops for their income. And so um, a lot of the, some of those acres small amount, but some are, you know, drained wetlands. And um, we can see based on our um, wetlands by design tool that there are opportunities in these agri agricultural settings to restore some of these wetlands. And um, it's, it's a balance, you know, that we're, we're in some cases asking uh, a producer to uh, alter their cropping uh, patterns on the land. And that has economic impact to the producer. So it's often a challenge. I mean, it, not often, it always almost is a challenge uh, to work with producers to, um, you know, restore wetlands uh, on their properties. Uh, but it's not impossible. I mean, we do have success. Uh, we have actually, uh, several uh, wetland restoration projects going in in the Upper East River watershed, which is a tributary to the Green Bay. Uh, and uh, the momentum is on our side. Let me just, let me put it that way. Um, the momentum and the funding uh, and the partners and the partnerships. Um, the, uh, I, I think there's, it's a new world coming in agriculture. Um, there is, uh, a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of information, a lot of outreach going on uh, to producers about soil health and water quality uh, practices. And many of them are adopting these new practices. And there's funding to help this transition. I mean, this is a transition uh, where new uh, equipment is gonna be needed by the producers for this new kind of agriculture. And the equipment is not cheap. Um, we, in fact, TNC, we, we purchased a couple of uh, interseeding uh, devices, which we now uh, rent or loan out to farmers to use to get cover crops on the ground. So um, there's a transition occurring. 
and uh, the momentum is building and the funding is there and the partners are there. So I'm really, uh, <laughs> despite my sort of uh, downer uh, comments to start here, um, I, I do see um, a real better future for uh, agriculture in our wetlands. Uh, in our uh, at least at least where I work here in Northeast Wisconsin, and uh, I know that's you know it varies throughout the country, but uh, I think there is uh, there's hope. And I'll just add on that you know a lot of that work is is farmer led. There's yes, a yes. Department of Agricultural Grant Program called the Producer Led Groups, and um, if you haven't heard about it, please go check it out on their website. The there's I think over 35 groups, uh, watershed groups of farmers coming together to try to understand how they can better protect uh, water resources throughout the state. Mm -hmm. So that's really encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for mentioning that, Sarah. So it's great. That just goes to show that collaborative nature, you know, working together um, mm -hmm. to help our environment is what we're all about. And working with those farmer led groups is something that. Um, I love to talk about, and so I'm really glad we got to talk about it today um, because real change is happening. Um, and so it's really fun to be a part of that um, as the Nature Conservancy. Um, so I kind of a fun one next. I would love to go around and just hear everyone's, you know, favorite wetland species or one of them. Um, I know there's so, so many out there, um, but, you know, you spend so much time in wetlands. So I'd love to love to hear. <laughs> I think ahead, I should Sarah. go before Mike because he's going to have a great answer. And so I better get my <laughs> less great answer out of the way. Everyone go before Mike. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have to admit, I am a physical scientist and uh, mm. the mm. biology is something that I am always learning. And I love going out into the field with Mike because he is our ecologist and he can tell you wonderful stories and help you identify a million things that you just walk past all the time. So my favorite species <laughs> in a wetland is anything I can identify. <laughs> I think I have to steal that one from Sarah as well. <laughs> Well, okay. Um, so my favorite wetlands are ephemeral wetlands. And these are little you know, ephemeral water bodies that occur in the woods in the spring. And um, as a kid, I just loved to go out and uh, my little dip net, you know, and catch all these little uh, strange creatures that live in these ephemeral wetlands, you know, uh, and they're beautiful sights. I mean, they're just gorgeous little especially after a winter in Wisconsin you know you, everything's frozen and you can go out in the woods and there's little wetlands and the you know the wood frogs are calling and the spring peepers and the and then the toads are singing and it's uh they're just darling places and the I suppose a little creature that I really <laughs> like amongst all of those creatures are the little fairy shrimp which are that long and they are a shrimp, um, but they uh, they live in these ephemeral wetlands, and they uh, have an ephemeral. The adults just have a well, they have an ephemeral life. So the adults uh, mate, and they lay their eggs, and the eggs drop to the bottom, and the pond dries up, and they just hope that next spring there will be water in that pond. And when the water comes, the eggs hatch, and then they swim around again. And they have such a cool um, motion. They just sort of glide under the water. They're like little ships under the water. And they don't dart about, which a lot of the other insects, and this is not an insect, but um, insects, you know, are always kind of darting about and they're kind of jumpy. But the, but the fairy shrimp are just kind of cruising around under the water surface. And they're uh, such a sign of reborn life. I, you know, I just, I, I am very fond of the fairy shrimp. So. Oh, well, thanks, Mike. That was a great answer. Sarah, you knew it. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'd love to pose this question to all of our listeners here today. If you want to chat in what you love about wetlands or what you like to see in wetlands, we'd love to hear that. Um, I guess I will just say that I do love a spring peeper. 
Um, probably for one of the same reasons, Mike, you like the shrimp is because they just make, they come right in time for spring and they give you that hope where, oh my gosh, the warmer weather's coming, the frogs are here. So that yeah. means that it's on its way. Um, so I'd love to hear that. But I do have, you know, one last question um, for the group here um, before we kind of start wrapping up the presentation. Um, and that is just, you know, what can, you know, what can we do? What can our listeners do today to help our wetlands? Hmm. Well, I, I, I'll just jump in. I, I guess I would say um, there are organizations you can join like the Nature Conservancy, of course, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, there are other organizations that are specifically uh, focused on wetland conservation protection. Like in Wisconsin, we have a great organization, the Wisconsin Wetland Association. Um, they're a very strong organization, do a lot of good work on policy and on the ground, working with municipalities, landowners, um, producers, farm producers, and so on. So, uh, you know, joining a group like that and supporting them is, uh, is a big thing uh, that we could do. Um, and I'll kind of steal a comment from Caitlin that, um, you know, these uh, citizen science opportunities are, they're cool, they're fun. Um, I mean, there's just seems to be more and more opportunities to go out and work with some real experts to catalog, uh, you know, species uh, or vegetation or, or, or well, just some characteristics of these wetlands. And oftentimes um, something is found that's really important and it just raises the significance of a site and it helps um, other groups come in and protect those sites. So I, I think citizen science is a, it's a great new movement and uh, you know, it's, and it's fun too, so. I would say if there's a wetland that you love, tell somebody about it. Um, mm -hmm. They tend to be kind of hidden. You know, there's, it's not, not easy to put a trail through a wetland. You kind of got to go around them. You got to put a boardwalk over them. Um, so I think people who aren't always out in nature can, can miss them. And so um, the more that people know that they're great, wonderful places and they're deserving of protection, the better. I think all of that can lead to volunteering with us if you're interested. Again, it's a great way to get involved with citizen science as well as um, we have these work days all around the state. So you might find your new favorite wetland. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all um, for presenting and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us and your time. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, so I just have a couple last um, comments here to wrap up. Um, so if we want to get the slideshow back. Um, so I also want to give a special shout out to the behind the scenes team who is helping this um, all seem easy. Um, you don't see them, but they're back there doing great work. Um, so thank you to that team. Um, but continue, we want to invite you to continue to celebrate National Wetlands Month with us um, by going to our nature.org slash Midwest Wetlands. It is a new page where you can continue to learn about the weird, wonderful, wicked cool creatures found um, in our wetlands in the Midwest. Um, you'll find stories from our scientists, more uh, uh, wetland quizzes. I know you like those. Um, and you can also find a wetland near you to plan your next visit, um, like Sarah recommended. Um, so this is a wonderful place to continue celebrating and would love for you to stop by. Um, next slide. We would also like to invite you to our upcoming summer stroll at Lulu Lake so you can experience uh, one of these wonderful wetlands yourself. Um, the tour will be on June 11th from 10 o'clock till noon. Um, you'll have a chance to um, get an inside tour from our conservation staff and you'll get to meet Sarah Gasky in person. Um, the space is limited, so please register online if you're interested in joining and we really hope to see you there. Um, next slide. So thank you. I will follow up with an email with the recording for today and all the links and resources we talked about throughout the presentation. Um, we'll also have a four minute survey in there 
um, that will really help us inform the kinds of events that you know, we offer. So please consider filling that out um, as a resource for us. Um, your feedback really makes sure we're creating um, things that are of interest and exciting um, for you to engage with. Um, so if you did like today's event, please follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and if you want to stay up to date on all the great conservation work happening there, we have great posts all the time um, to keep you up to date on what's happening in Wisconsin. Um, and finally, I just have the biggest heartfelt thank you to everyone who tuned in today, to our dedicated Legacy Club members and Warren Knoll Society members. Um, together, we are making a difference for the world we love and the wetlands we love. Um, so really look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and with that, goodbye.